Lord, uh, I apologize for the interruption. I have found the map you requested. Thank you, Mason. Well, if it is not too forward, uh, Lord Trazen, uh, may I ask why you require such a rare human map? Because, Mason, this map shows differences in comparison to our ancient Necron star systems. Oh, it is most impressive, my lord, uh, but seems rather complicated. Oh, if only your uncle were here. He understood much of human colonization. Let me show you, Mason. This galaxy is a tableau of stories. Some of these stories are long finished, their authors being mere dust on the papyrus of time, while some are still being written. Many have been lost to time, and it falls to us to be the librarians of our galaxy. I have spent eons collecting, saving, and cataloging these stories. I would like to clarify that this is a tour of this galaxy according to Imperial cartography, not according to Necron cartography. Remember that, as it will be important. This is a tour of the Segmentum Obscurus. In the galactic northeast, there is a small world with much importance. The rains never stop falling here. Its orderly streets are full of life. The prayers of mankind blast out from the Vox units placed on the streets and echo through the crowds. This world is lit by the fires of faith. This world is Dimamar. It is a cardinal world. Its importance to the Ecclesiarchy cannot be understated. It churns out soldiers and blessings in equal measure, and the temples and monuments are never empty or silent. I have a whole shelf of literature from Dimamar. This far-flung world raised its head from the blood-choked mire of the Horus heresy and founded the Confederation of Light. This small, faraway world created a doctrine, a theory that I have always been fond of. The preachers of the world believed that the Emperor's sacrifice was to be held as an example this was less than popular with the gold-clad ecclesiarchs who ruled the temple of the savior emperor. These priests used the idea of the emperor to further their own selfish gains. It is here that a character with a head worthy of display appeared, Sebastian Thor. The Confederation of Light was ultimately deemed a heretical organization Forces were mobilized to Dimama, and the butcher's work began. It did not take long for the world to be culled, but a few chosen believers escaped. Ultimately, the Confederation of Light was all but destroyed, until, in dramatic human fashion, the Age of Apostasy began and the Confederation of Light re-emerged. 
led by none other than the noble, selfless hero, Sebastian Thor. He declared that one of the greatest and most important imperial leaders was a heretic, and I admit, I do not know if he was or not. But under Goj Van Dyer's leadership, the corruption and stupidity were almost unparalleled. In a perfect twist of fate, Van Dyer sent a group known as the Frateris Templar, a terrible name, to kill Thor. Thor rallied billions to his side. Even Adeptus Astartes and Van Dyer himself was ultimately killed. Thor and the Order were recognized by both the Imperium and the Ecclesiarchy. Ultimately, the Confederation was absorbed into the Adeptus Ministorum, and Thor was made an Ecclesiarch. Atop the mountain, Gren's Peak, you can still see Sebastian Thor's monument, blade held high in stoic rebellion, watching over his world for eternity. And while it is still ongoing, that is the story of Dimamar, a faraway world that proves the age-old theory. Even the smallest beings can affect the greatest changes. Far to the galactic north of our galaxy, lay the Halo Stars. The stars have many names. The Wanderer's Call, the Peratek Vale, the Shroud of Vorathrax. All names for the same thing. Draped in a galactic fog that covers over 200,000 light years, the stars are the stage for unknown tales, kingdoms, and worlds beyond count. This ancient formation of stars is thought to be the oldest in all of the galaxy. Many in the Imperium have not ventured out as far as the Halo stars, and the majority of those who have set off to this mysterious area have never returned. The Halo stars are thought by some, to be the edge of the known galaxy, as traveling past this formation of stars leads one into the endless void. Found here are the traces of age-old civilizations, their thrones having sat empty for millions of years. The kings who reigned here are unknown, their courts now silent, haunted ruins buried beneath the sands for millennia. The bones of these kingdoms have survived through history and will continue to do so. Beneath the dust, we may even find stories that are similar to ours. The Halo Stars are merely a stage on which dramas are playing out in private. The music of the orchestras may never be heard by my kind, but perhaps they will be heard by those who live beyond the veil of the halo stars. In the galactic northeast of the Segmentum lies Neogeddon, a dead world a doomed world, left void of all life as a warning. A warning that says clearly, do not come here. There is no atmosphere here. The sands of Neogeddon rip across dunes that are lifeless skeins of sand and dead necrodermis. The dunes hide a great beast. This tragic world is where the vile Catan the deceiver fell into its eons long slumber, left there to never be roused again. Human traders and Mechanicus explorators 
have landed on this broken world and have all been lost. Records clearly show the subsurface megastructures built after the war in heaven, and I cannot begin to fathom the horror that those humans beheld on that world. The deceiver was cast down, its vile sentience shattered. Though, as we know, the deceiver would ultimately return. The world remains lifeless. Its empty halls will forever guard the containment vessels that hold fragments of the deceased god. Dynasties entombed themselves as wardens and vigilant guardians, though contact with them is no longer possible. Perhaps their bodies are now inert or corrupted. The deceiver may reappear from this grave world, draped in the black of the void, seeking to sow war and conflict once again. May we Necrons never forget the price that we paid. I hope all life in the universe sees the screaming storms as a warning and leave the world as it should be, alone and silent. To the galactic southeast, there is a small world that is rarely visited and of little regard. The world is Geren. It is unimportant compared to other worlds that the Imperium of Man controls. It is a world of rolling hills and vast sky-splitting plains. The oceans seethe with monstrous life. Great leviathans wage eternal campaigns beneath the waves, just as the humans who live here wage their own wars. Geron is scarred and cratered by the wars that have been fought here. The Astartes on this planet, the regents of Geron, are enormously proud of their small world. The world weathers many storms, and though, in the grand scheme of things, it may not be as important as Terra, it is still worth remembering. My agents do not collect the humans from Garen, as I believe that the universe has greater plans for them. Good luck to the humans, who fight so bitterly for their world, because the more they fight, the more the orcs are drawn to them. There is darkness here, but also a fair measure of light. A light that flickers in the strip lumens of the granite mountains of Geron's many continents. In the heart of the Segmentum is the world that birthed the Grey Lady. The Hammers here have been at work for more than 10,000 years. The ice winds scour the rugged, frozen landscapes, and from the ice, great cities break through the storms and pierce the skies. Frozen banners flutter against the buildings, causing cascades of ice to rain onto the snow-covered streets below. The streets of Vostroya. One of the longest-standing imperial worlds, this honorable planet has produced billions of soldiers and even more machines. The mountains are vast. They house never-ceasing factories that ring out with the songs of the hammer. Bullets, bandages, and reinforced hypercoils for night-class Mechanicus Titans all come from here. In my gallery, 
you can find the original copy of Treatise Elati, the book that was written by the Grey Lady. The Grey Lady is an imperial saint who lived on this world. She is the enigmatic mother to all the children of Vostroya. She is both fable and fact. Acting in a manner of pure independence, Vostroya denied soldiers and valuable resources to both the Emperor of Mankind and Horus during the heresy. After the Horus heresy ended, the guilt of Vostroya's refusal to help the Emperor led to the creation of the Firstborn, a group of soldiers that are fiercely devoted to their traditions, perpetually indebted to the Imperium and proud of their long-standing affiliation with the Mechanicus. Stubborn to a fault and staggeringly fond of curled, pointed facial hair, these brutes stayed on a world that no one should live on. The Vostroyans offer their firstborn children to the Astra Militarum, and the rest work tirelessly in the Manufactorums. Vostroya is a world of culture and history that stands out even amongst the thousands of equally impressive human-settled worlds. Eastward, there is a border forged by the humans. The border delineates the entrance to one of their hundreds of sectors. Composed of eight subsectors, the Gothic sector is remarkably interesting. In the Bayon Moor subsector, a device of ours was found on a planet the humans refer to as Fularis. It was on this lush, verdant world that the will of eternity was laid to rest after her service in the war in heaven. Not a being, but a ship. A mighty ship, a black stone fortress. This flying destruction matrix was laid to rest after its service against the vile Catan. Her engines burned for their last time as she broke the atmosphere. It is well documented in my vaults that the ship's captain stayed with her so she would not be alone in the eternities in which she would rest. The will of eternity landed in a dense jungle and it was there that she would stay and should have stayed until Abaddon, the Despoiler, appeared. Abaddon somehow located the will of eternity and, in an unforgivable insult to all Necron kind, reactivated the ship and murdered her sleeping captain. After Abaddon reactivated the fortress, he destroyed Fularis for no other reason than pure spite. That ship was used in the start of the Gothic War and the Twelfth Black Crusade. The Gothic sector was blocked from all contact with the outside galaxy by a powerful warp storm. The worlds and their inhabitants fought a vicious campaign against Abaddon and his soldiers. Millions perished as a result of Abaddon's ambitions. The Imperium fought valiantly, and Battlefleet Gothic waged a campaign of extermination against Abaddon, the Aldari, and human pirate forces. The Gothic War spanned 20 human years. What was unknown at the time, however, was that the Gothic War was nothing more than a decoy, a distraction that was set in motion so that Abaddon could steal the will of eternity.
In the northwest region of the Segmentum, there is another invisible human border. Across that border lies the Scarus Sector. The Scarus Sector is alive with industry, war, poverty, and intrigue. And most importantly, an abundance of notable history. Scarus was named after a favored captain of a word-bearer legion, a name given by Lorgar himself. This sector was at war before I awoke, and it played no small part in the history of our galaxy. It is the home of the tales of Battlefleet Gothic, and truly, it is a wonder to behold. In this busy, secretive zone sits the capital, Eustace Majoris, a hive world that governs this vast space. The skies of the world weep acid rain onto the bowed heads of billions of indentured workers serving their masters. Masters who work in desperate need to keep the population controlled and producing. Scarus has been a victim of rebellions, gang wars, chaos outbreaks, and more recently, a particularly relentless fungal infestation. In my sub-lecture series, Notable Imperial Inquisitorial Assets, I highlighted two particular inquisitors. One was Gideon Ravenor, and the other, his former master, Gregor Eisenhorn. It is in the Skara sector that Eisenhorn and his team earned their bones. Ugh, apologies, that is a human phrase, and I really must expunge it from my dialogue banks. It was amidst these rebellions and outbreaks that Eisenhorn proved himself a true hero. He stepped beyond the realms of considered morality and did what needed to be done. Eisenhorn saved a whole city, and perhaps even the entire world. Since then, he has not been seen in some time, but I know he is still out there somewhere, and I know that Ravenor, a Terek Alpha great psyker, knows where Eisenhorn is. Scarus will remain a battleground and a hyper-industrial hub where billions of humans scratch out a living on acid-eaten streets. I wish them all the luck in their lives of mediocrity. To the galactic north, there is a world that may yet set itself ablaze with rebellion. This is Mordian, home of the Mordian Iron Guard. From underground barracks and redoubts, the elegantly dressed soldiers of Mordian press on, playing songs of honor and courage with their pipes and bugles. Mordian is yet another grim and dark planet. Its populace lives in perpetual night, for the planet barely spins, causing half the world to be a dark, depressing nightmare, and the other half to be a burned, ash-filled wasteland. I will never understand why humans are so insistent on settling upon these cursed worlds. Nothing grows in the wasteland except human arrogance. Do not be fooled by their well-maintained uniforms with their crimped shirts, neat caps and fine epaulets. The Mordian Iron Guard are well known in propaganda. However, this propaganda does not mention that these soldiers spend half their time crushing on world rebellions. They are not much more than enforcers for the world's ruling elite, ensuring that their grip on power is never threatened. 
If the populace could simply accept their lot as being servants on a world of equal day and night, then the Iron Guard could leave and do something productive. The world does, however, stand defiant. A war happened here, though many have forgotten it. The Battle of Mordian. Like many human betrayals, this one was caused by covetous greed. A cabal of humans on Mordian turned their attention to the Dark Gods, who are always happy to promise rewards in exchange for innocent blood. In the caverns beneath Mordian's second city, these greedy lords finished their ritual and brought chaos to Mordian. Many other worlds would have fallen, not Mordian. Eventually, the Loyalists were forced to retreat to the Tetrarchal Palace, and it was here that the Mordian Iron Guard would make its last stand against the forces of chaos. Far above the burning skies of Mordian, the Imperium of Man had witnessed the many battles. A coven of psychers had set about counteracting the power of the ritual performed beneath the surface of Mordian. Just as the remaining heroes of Mordian were about to fire their final shots, the coven's plan came to fruition. The flame in the sky vanished and the surviving Mordians watched as the demons they were about to be slaughtered by were vanquished before their eyes. And thus, after an unexpected savior appeared from above, Mordian lived and still lives. Though the world's capital remains fortified, ever watchful over its soldiers, war came here and lost, and Mordian remembers. There are other actors on the stage of the Segmentum Obscurus, ancient, emotional, and artistic beings. The Aldari from Imlok, with its timeless works of art and engines of Vorl, to Sif and its Harlequin courts. The Aldari hold many worlds, and their influence is vast. South of the Halo Stars, sits a band of Eldari worlds. I do not believe they do anything by mistake, but I do not know why they settled here. Perhaps their gods simply wanted them beset on all sides by humans, orcs, and even tyranids. The Exodite worlds in this segmentum are few, yet they are exceptionally interesting. The Harlequins, those mysterious, unusual performers, reside on Sith, waiting to spread their music to other worlds and somehow know what will happen, what will come to pass. Each of the Aldari worlds here house thousands of artists, warriors, and creatives. The dancers wave and weave amidst bone singers, whose songs change the fabric of reality and reforms their wraithbone into perfect works of art. From their vaulted halls and living space stations, the Aldari watch the space around them, intervening, acting, or simply witnessing. Perhaps this is all a launch platform for some grand battle yet to begin. To the galactic west lies yet another human border. This border is lined with ships that serve the many armies that live in the Vorsk subsector, a place of true bedlam. The worlds in the Vorsk subsector are tumultuous, to say the least. This small subsector 
has seen some truly memorable wars. Castellix, a brutalized world, conquered and ruled over by the ever tiresome Iron Warriors of the Fourth Legion. The Fourth enslaved every soul and kept the population in chains, working them to death. Ionis, an imperial farming world, a true vision of peace with its rolling hills, gentle breezes and decent humans. The continents flash gold from orbit, filled with the crops that feed so many humans. Gemin Prime, another imperial world, a world of deep core miners. Beneath the basalt slabs of the continents, the humans here toiled and extracted resources that were vital to the operation of the Imperium. The cities were squat, low beasts that housed millions of proud, peaceful men and women. Obetrus, the rogue, a world that obeys no gravitational commands and goes where it pleases. This world of dark forests and darker beasts flies silently through the galaxy and houses mystifying beings with unknown goals. Syrith, whose skies are black from the discharge of billions of crude human weapons. The Mechanicus employed their vast ships to flatten the hills of the world and built it into nothing more than a firing range. Everything must be tested somewhere, and because of this, long gone are the raging waterfalls and thousand-mile rivers with their unique life. The world has devolved into a flat testing area for humanity's most prized toys of war. Pseudopol is the brother world to Cyrith, a world of pylons antenna and communication equipment built and owned by the Imperium. Every communication in the subsector passed through the million offices and listening stations on Pseudopol. The inefficient human radars and dishes were hidden within the vast mountain ranges of the planet. Then there was the world from which this sector takes its name, Vorsk. Vorsk was another imperial world that boasted a population of well over four billion. They lived in haunting dark streets, with thousands packed into a single building, no power to anyone, with the exception of the welders and builders who made equipment for the other worlds in the sector. And of course, Scythia, one of my preferred tomb worlds, the Ovarach dynasty slept here, buried deep beneath the soils, their pyramids turned into wooded mountains by the passage of time, waiting to bring the frenzy of perfect war to the stars once more. Orcs. These primitive green-skinned brutes offer little to the galaxy, and evidence of this is found in the ruins of the Vorsk subsector. The orcs conquered the Iron Warriors world of Castalax, slaughtering the slumbering millions on Scythia and destroying every other world in the Vorsk subsector. Vorsk is now an orc subsector, ruled over by tyrannical war bosses. Just another tragedy in a galaxy at war. Near the Eye of Terror, a dark, polluted planet floats above a mixture of frigid icecapes and volcanic mountains. This world is none other than Medusa. An unpredictable world, the tectonic plates are always shifting, creating new oceans, rivers and mountain ranges. The environment on Medusa is incredibly harsh and proves difficult for humans to exist on. 
The humans that live on Medusa are weathered by these difficulties. They are strong people who expel weakness or sickness from their population. Those who are unfit voluntarily surrender themselves to the wasteland, sacrificing their own lives so that they are not wasting any of the scarce resources that could be used by the healthy. It seems fitting that on a world where only the strongest can survive, that the Primarch Ferus Manus eventually emerged from the mountains of Medusa. A capsule crashed into Karashi, the highest mountain on Medusa. The impact was so forceful that the explosions were felt across the entire world, toppling mountains and causing tidal waves of ash. Inside of this capsule was Ferus Manus, Primarch of the Iron Hands. With the devastation and transformation of his arrival, Ferus Manus awakened something that had been sleeping beneath the mountains. He emerged from Karashi, a fully grown man, and spent his youth rampaging across the northern reaches of this world, conquering tribes and slaying beasts. His legacy tells of his hunting of the great beast Azenorth, a vast killing machine that was said to be made of living steel. There were many stories of Azenoth murdering civilians on Medusa and being known as an unkillable beast. During Ferris Manus's travels, he encountered Azenoth atop an active volcano. He lured the great worm towards the mouth of the volcano and drowned Azenoth in the magma. Ferus Manus had done the unthinkable. He destroyed a being that was thought to be invulnerable. As Ferus Manus drowned Azenoth, however, the worm's living steel coated his arms. This is where he earned the name the Iron Hand. I am convinced that Azenoth was a grand conqueror worm seeded on Medusa by the world's lord to guard his sleeping subjects. If this is the case, the Primarch destroyed one of our greatest machines in single combat. Not bad for a human. I do have a theory. There is a conqueror worm in my galleries. They have interstitial relay mechanisms which study their opponents and transfer any useful information, including genetic sequences and DNA coding. It is therefore possible that beneath the ruins of Medusa, there may be a terminal which contains the genetic code of Ferus Manus. Ferus Manus was a remarkable hero, an incredible warrior, and an unmatched artisan. However, his story does not end on Medusa. In the northeastern corner of the Segmentum, roughly 37,000 light years from Caliban, you will find a dim, silent star at the edges of our galaxy. In all wars, there are locations of strategic importance. Sometimes these locations stand as monuments to war. This small, meager star pulls eight worlds in its orbit. The star has no name, and that is fitting. This sector is the birthplace of the grandest of human tragedies. This is the Istvan system. Dead worlds and void exposed hulks dwell here, a silent testimony to a monumental betrayal. There are many important names in the Horus heresy. Every Primarch was involved, and many of them were here on the world of Istvan III. 
A tortured world, butchered and silent for millennia. Beneath the dead soil and blasted wreckage lie the lost and forgotten soldiers of this terrible world. There is no atmosphere, no life, only the dead. Istvan III was first conquered by the Raven Guard, the sons of Corvus Corax, and the world was brought into the realm of the Imperium, eventually being shown the Imperial truth. At the same time, the Dark Gods had begun poisoning the mind of Horus, who eventually came to corrupt his Primarch brothers, Fulgrim, Motarian, and Angron. The governor of Istvan III, Vardus Pral, became a rebel against the Imperium, and over the course of years, began a quiet crusade against the loyalists of the Coral City, eventually leaving it ravaged. Burned black by the vast weapons of war, the ruins stand as a grave mark to the betrayed. The corrupted Primarchs planned to expunge the Loyalists from their legions as well, and they launched their first wave of attacks. Captain Sal Tarvitz, a well-respected member of the Emperor's children, had been ordered to be a key part of the assault on Istvan III. Captain Tarvitz, however, suspected something was awry and changed places in the Imperial fleet with a member of the Emperor's children at the last second. Upon inspecting the ship, he discovered virus weaponry had been loaded into the cannons and suddenly realized what was about to unfold. Tarvitz went to the surface of Istvan III and warned the Loyalists that the world was going to be attacked. His bold and selfless actions saved hundreds of lives. Horus was not finished, however. He virus-bombed the planet, which turned all living things into a flammable compound. Then, being the vile creature he is, Horus dealt his killing blow by firebombing the planet and setting it ablaze. The firestorm killed 16 billion people and destroyed countless cities. Istvan III was the first world that Horus would kill. The surviving Astartes, who had been warned by Tarvitz, emerged from their bunkers and witnessed the enormity of the betrayal. Disregarding orders, Angron led the charge as he and the World Eaters attacked the survivors, killing all that remained. Amidst this slaughter, however, one man remained. He was entombed in a living machine, a dreadnought. That man was Rylanor the Ancient. He was on Istvan III in his dreadnought as the attacks began. After the brutal atrocity occurred on Istvan III, Rylanor waited for 10,000 years, plotting his revenge against Fulgrim. Rylanor lured his vile father back to the world and would have his chance at vengeance. He detonated one of the last remaining virus bombs in an effort to eradicate his own father. His attempt was unsuccessful but he did manage to injure Fulgrim's vain pride. Rylanor the Ancient died on Istvan III, the last victim of the original betrayal. But perhaps his weakening of Fulgrim will allow another to cut the head from that pathetic, writhing serpent. I hope to someday recover the now lifeless, rusted dreadnought that houses the bones of that fearless son of the Emperor. His steel coffin will be a monument to the power of revenge and justice, for Rylanor is a human we should all remember and respect. In the blackened dead streets of the Coral City, 
A few tenacious and proud men led a doomed stand against those who had betrayed them. These heroes deserved better. The tales of Istvan III have been largely expunged by both the Inquisition and the Ecclesiarchy for reasons of control. But there are bones on Istvan still. My gallery and containment vessels are filled with relics from this tragic world. And the most complete record of the betrayal of Istvan III can be found in my Horus Heresy gallery. Istvan III changed the course of our galaxy's history. Its consequences are significant and echo throughout all of time. The Battle of Istvan III was the first war in the heresy, but it was not the last. A short distance from Istvan III is another tomb world, the site where the Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Raven Guard chapters were almost completely exterminated. Istvan V. After Istvan III, the Loyalists had been purged from the legions which were devoted to Horus. The Emperor sent the Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Raven Guard to bring his treasonous sons to bear for their crimes. These Astartes would land on Istvan V and bring the light of the Emperor's wrath upon the Death Lords, the Emperor's children, the World Eaters, and the Sons of Horus. Or, as they had once been known, the Lunar Wolves. In a magnificent collaboration, the Night Lords, Iron Warriors, Word Bearers, and Alpha Legion were to provide assistance to the Loyalist Astatis. These legions had, however, already sworn themselves to Horus's cause, and it was they who would stab the Loyalists in the back on Istvan V. Nearly 30,000 traitors had spent weeks fortifying the world against the inevitable bombardment that was to come. The poisoned, fallen sons of the Emperor stood eagerly awaiting their Loyalist brothers. The skies were turned black by the falling drop pods and lander craft, and the Loyalists began their strike on the world. As the Loyalists waged their war of blood, the allies of the Loyalists set their betrayal in motion. Witnessing the attack on the unsuspecting Raven Guard and Salamanders, Ferros Manus finally realized that he had walked into a trap. It was here that Ferris Manus and Fulgrim engaged in a historical battle, each wielding the weapons they had once forged for each other. After a fierce struggle, Ferris Manus held his blade to Fulgrim's neck, but in a moment of desperation, Fulgrim drew the demonic lair blade and stopped Ferris Manus from striking him. In the end, the will of the Lair Blade had overcome Fulgrim as he decapitated his own brother, fully succumbing to the Dark Gods. To punctuate the totality of Horus's betrayal, Fulgrim delivered the head of Ferris Manus to Horus himself. On Istvan V, the Imperium learned the true depth of the heresy. Korax had been saved by his sons after being terribly wounded. Ferus Manus had been killed by his own brother, and Vulcan had vanished. Though, as we have learned throughout the Horus heresy, Vulcan lives. The Istvan system is a place best left alone. The stories that began here are unfinished. Fulgrim is still out there, reveling in degeneracy somewhere in the war. What a shame that he couldn't be more like my Fulgrim, who still has so much to learn and might yet reclaim the title of the Emperor's Child. The sons of Ferris Manus 
have not forgotten the murder of their father, and perhaps time will give them a chance at revenge. The reverberations from Istvan are complex. It is a page in a novel that is inked in blood. What happened on Istvan V was a turning point for the history of the galaxy. Tragedy and betrayal are the messages entombed in the Istvan system. Messages that humanity should not forget. North of Medusa lies the destroyed, shattered world of Caliban. The former home of the Primarch, Lion L. Johnson. Caliban was a world of gnarled, darkened forests, filled with animals and beasts, worthy of only the greatest hunters. The beasts were twisted and changed by the powers of the warp, that leaked from the Eye of Terror, making them vicious monsters. Caliban was inhabited by a band of honorable knights who sought to do good on the world. This group of knights was known as the Order. When they encountered the young Primarch, they thought he was a beast, but they stayed their blades and brought him to their civilization after realizing he was not a beast, but a man. And every man can be a soldier. It was here that he forged a bond with his counterpart, Luther. Over time, Luther mentored the lion and brought him under his wing. The two eventually grew to be brothers. The brothers fought side by side for years against the beasts of Caliban, and through their tenacity, the two oversaw the growth of the Order. They ultimately convinced the humans on Caliban to join the First Crusade against the Great Beasts. Led by the tactical genius of the Lion, the humans of Caliban had purged the world of the chaos-tainted monsters in ten Terran years. It was after this crusade that the Lion was named Supreme Grand Master of the Order. From the Order, the Dark Angels were formed. They were named from an ancient Calibanite legend that told of dark-winged angels coming from the skies to save the meek and the poor. Unbeknownst to the Lion, Luther quietly grew jealous of his elevation to Supreme Grand Master. It was this jealousy that would lead to betrayal and war between the sons of Caliban. Luther's envy led to him allowing an assassination attempt against the lion, paving the way for him to gain the lion's power. On the world of Sarosh, the Dark Angels suffered greatly, and the lion sent Luther and a detachment back to Caliban to find more soldiers. Though not intended as an insult, this caused the resentment inside Luther to grow further. The 500 Astartes sent with Luther slowly found themselves devoted to him instead of the Lion. Under the leadership of Luther, the Dark Angels that were loyal to him had morphed into a band of traitors known as the Fallen Angels, or simply the Fallen. In his quiet fury, Luther had turned Caliban from a land of lush forests into vast grey cities of manufactorums and arcologies. After the heresy, the Lion returned to Caliban and found that Due to his complete neglect of the world, the remaining Astartes had now turned against him. The lion weathered many storms, the beasts, the Horus heresy, but worst of all was that after the siege of terror, 
he returned to his home only to be fired on by the guns of the world that he and his brothers had helped forge. The fallen angels had recast the world and now turned it on their father. Ultimately, the lion confronted, dueled, and almost killed his fallen brother, Luther. Luther then employed powers granted to him by the dark gods and wounded the lion. But at this moment, Luther was struck by the weight of his own betrayal and refused to kill his old friend. This enraged the Chaos Gods, and they unleashed their wrath upon Caliban. The world was destroyed by a powerful warp storm. The Dark Angels entered the tower where the Lion and Luther had battled, searching for their fearless Primarch. However, only Luther remained, broken by the enormity of his own betrayal. The lion was gone. He had been taken into the shadows by a group of strange subhuman creatures called the Watchers in the Dark. The lion remained there, lost for ten millennia. What remains of Caliban is not much more than a fortress floating in space. For more than ten thousand years, this fortress, known as the Rock, was all that survived of old Caliban. Until now. It is rumored that in the dense forests of other worlds that a familiar rumbling can be heard. The lion has perhaps returned to stalk his foes one more time, leaving some to believe that the tale of Caliban is not yet finished. On the eastern edge of the Eye of Terror, there is a world of great significance. Control of this world has been heavily fought over for hundreds of years. Some understand its importance, others do not. Orcs, Aldari, humans both loyal and fallen alike, have died here. Even those repulsive Tyranids have launched attacks on this world. Its crust punctured by veins of Noctilith, it is a bleak, ravaged place. The humans here huddle in ramshackle houses, billions living in hive cities that are controlled by the Imperium, the Mechanicus and the Ecclesiarchy. This arid war world is vigilous. Located within the Nachmund Gauntlet, Vigilus is a vital world, holding one of the few secure warp travel points in the Segmentum. Worlds are defined by their wars and by their soldiers, and few have birthed as many as Vigilus. As the Great Rift spread its hateful mass through our galaxy, it spewed forth nothing other than orcs, of course. From the rift came Speed Lord Krull Daka and his green-skinned army of savages. Incapable of taking the world or its cities, Krull Daka took to doing what orcs do best. They turned the wastelands between the hive cities into race strips and set about acting like a legion of belligerent, open-mouthed idiots, which is what they are after all. I do wonder what the Crawk would think of their ridiculous teeth-obsessed kin. In the wake of the Rift's opening, the shields of the Hive cities failed, leaving them open to attacks from Krull Daka. Unbeknownst to Krull Daka and his hordes, there was a dormant threat lying in wait, and his attacks triggered the well-laid plans of a gene-stealer cult. This cult known as the Pauper Princes, were enraged that the world they had planned to gain control of was under attack as they sought to claim Vigilus for their star children. From the undersinks of the Hive cities, 
Millions of these mutated monstrosities spewed forth, their claws and teeth chewing the populace from within as the orcs launched total war from the outside. The rulers knew that they were lost if they did not receive aid immediately. And thus, the Aquilarian Council that governed Vigilus called for help from the Emperor. Rabute Gilliman himself decided the world was worth saving and sounded the call to action. Answering his call were Ultramarines, Space Wolves and the Iron Hands. The Astartes arrived and brought with them the gene-forged might of the Imperial War Machine. Vigilus was one of the first worlds to see full-scale deployment of Primaris Marines of multiple chapters. Against the Orcs and the Gene Stealers, the residents of Vigilus and their Astartes saviors fought valiantly, driving the Orcs into the wastes and forcing the Tyranids into the depths of the ruined undercities. The Space Wolves led vicious hunting assaults against the Tyranids, seeking out their leaders, yet only finding more cults. Ultimately, the Gene Stealers and the Orcs were both driven back, but at a terrible cost. One would think that this was enough war for a world. But Vigilus is a bastion world to the humans, and the struggle for control is endless. A corrupt planetary leader named Vanadan the Firebrand had been successfully convincing the people of Vigilus to follow him and the Dark Gods and to shy away from the Imperium's light. And it is at this time that the prophets of the Aldari foresaw a looming threat. That Vanadan and his followers would ultimately destroy Vigilus. The Aldari could not let this happen, and they dispatched an elite group of warriors known as the Wild Riders of Samhan to do away with Vanadan. These warriors were successful in exterminating Vanadan. However, this assassination only led to more bloodshed. In a display of pure irony, the Imperial forces mistakenly believed that Vigilus was being invaded and they killed the Aldari warriors, unaware that they were actually there to save the world. One more painful misunderstanding between two races who do not understand each other. One last foe would come for Vigilus, a Chaos Lord who was ordered by Abaddon to take the world. Harkon World Claimer, a name almost as foolish as Orakan the Diviner, brought his malice to bear against Vigilus. The war that came from this conflict is still raging to this day. Many have tried to take Vigilus, but its people are seasoned by war and refuse to sacrifice their control. It may take decades, but Harkon will one day come to learn that no one takes a world like this without bleeding for it. Some 11,000 years ago, the excess and boredom of the Aldari birthed a being. A sentience that had corrupted countless empires and races. A thing defined by excess, writhing endlessly in the sea of the warp. With Slanesh's birth, a rift was formed in the material realm of the galaxy. That rift is known as the Eye of Terror. The Aldari worlds that were touched by the formation of the Eye of Terror became known as Crone Worlds. These worlds were once the haunts of poets, musicians and noble warriors that became boiling cauldrons of hatred and mutation. Crone Worlds are what the Imperium calls demon worlds, 
and this is a suitable name. I have had to cordon off many a crone world, for the inhabitants are both too numerous and unpredictable. I cannot begin to imagine the treasures that lay unsaved on these worlds. By my records, there are nine crone worlds in the Cadian sector. Three are dead worlds, the others are home to the horrors of the warp. The Old Ones created a race capable of staggering, unimaginable beauty. And in their malice, they made this race capable of destroying itself through excess. Slanesh did not entirely destroy the Aldari, but by consuming so many of their worlds, what was left of their race was merely a shadow of its former self. Cadia, or as we Necrons refer to it, the Pylon world. Cadia was famous in the Imperium for the quality of the soldiers it produced and its fate. We had seeded the world with our substrata suppression emulators during the war in heaven. Located in the most ideal position to be a warden world, Cadia acted as a stronghold against the foul things that emerged from the Eye of Terror. It was a world connected, a link in the chain of the greatest weapon our species ever forged. And that weapon could constrict around the warp and close it off from our reality. Nameless horrors and servants of the Old Ones were destroyed during the time of its employment. After the Silent King's rebellion, after we fell into the Great Sleep, many of the worlds in the chain fell to the rigors of time. Eventually, this pylon world was settled by the humans. That world, that weapon, was Cadia. The soldiers bred on Cadia were the most famous humans in the Imperium. Cunning warriors who were humble in their duty. The Cadians stood proud until the end. The servants of the Warp knew that one day humanity could gain the knowledge of the pylons. If the pylons were activated, their technology could be turned against the Chaos worshippers and the Dark Gods would be reduced to nothing. Abaddon knew he had to stop this, and after a campaign against the forces of the Imperium, known as the 13th Black Crusade, Abaddon crashed the will of eternity into Cadia, destroying the ship and ultimately the world. Billions were killed. I was there. I met with the Fabricator General of Mars, we had tried to activate the ancient pylons to prevent the destruction of Cadia, but it was to no avail. It was a shame what happened. Cadia was destroyed, coming apart on a geographical level and suffering total core exposure and fragmentation. This was all to stop the humans from destroying the warp. Many of the pylons remain. The Fabricator General has a few in his possession. I do understand why those who are sympathetic to the Dark Gods would be worried at the prospect of their powers vanishing. It is reasonable to assume that at some point, the humans may activate a smaller version of our device and remove the warp from reality. Perhaps not entirely, but enough to make a difference. In the destruction of Cadia, the forces of Chaos martyred and galvanized billions. I have a feeling that this is all merely the beginning of the tale of the Cadian sector. For as Cadia stands, so does the Segmentum.
For many centuries, the power of the Eye of Terror had been growing. That galactic scar had swelled, its energies changing the universe around it, making travel and communication increasingly difficult. With the death of Cadia and so many other worlds surrounding the Eye of Terror, the warp could not be held back. The million light year storm of energy that has ripped its way across our galaxy is known as the Great Rift, or the Cicatrix Maldictum. Spanning from where Cadia once stood to the eastern fringes, this portal stands defiant, its scale almost beyond comprehension. The Great Rift has claimed billions of lives, and its emergence has split the Imperium of Man in two. Those who dwell on the Sol Sector side of the Rift live in the Imperium Sanctus. The remaining, the countless souls who have been separated from their kin, now dwell in the Imperium Nihilus. The beings who live beyond the Rift are at the mercy of the creatures that dwell within, leaving countless worlds at risk. Those who worship Chaos see it as a sign that their time is here. Those who do not know that war is coming, a new age of terror by the worshippers of darkness. The Great Rift has spread an immense amount of turmoil. It has split our galaxy in two. And there are signs that this is merely the beginning. True stories take time, and the story of the Segmentum Obscurus is millennia in the making. Our galaxy is a tapestry of stories. Betrayal and butchery give way to hope. Hope gives way to barbarism, and the cycle begins again, as the Segmentum Obscurus is a novel that is still being written. For now, I will leave the Segmentum to its own devices. For time is the greatest gift that can be given to the heroes of this embattled region of space. Time heals wounds. It affords us the opportunity to mourn our lust and to rebuild our strength. Strength with which we may face the many horrors of this small, fascinating sector of our galaxy. From the howling manufactorums of Vostroya to the haunted labyrinths of Neogeddon, it remains inviolate against the terrors that assail it. Time controls the fate of all worlds, and the Segmentum Obscurus is only the beginning of this journey.